ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests, colleagues and friends, it's with great pleasure that Dr. Kimia Takahashi and myself welcome you to this celebration of Japanese on the move. Over the past year, our video exhibition has featured the life stories of transnational people with a connection to Australia and Japan. You. Japanese on the Move is an exploration of language learning, intercultural communication and transnationalism in the 21st century. And we are all here today to celebrate our diverse languages, cultures and traditions that have brought us together at the Japan Foundation on this very special Friday evening. We've got an exciting program of speakers and performers lined up for you. And so, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over the floor to Professor Gail Whiteford, the Pro Vice Chancellor for Social Inclusion at Macquarie University, who will officially launch Japanese on the Move. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. I'm going to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past and present, and just extend that acknowledgement to any Indigenous guests we might have here tonight. Now, speaking of all things intercultural, I had a bit of an intercultural <laughs> misunderstanding on my way here. I just spent an hour and a Nearly a half in a taxi. It's crazy out there, I can tell you. So to pass the time, I was chatting to my young taxi driver, who was an international student who's recently gained citizenship in Australia. And a song came on the radio, and I said, do you know who that is? I said, no. I said, that's George Harrison. He was a former Beatle. I said, I said have you heard of the Beatles? And he said, I think I once heard something about them. Uh, did they write their own songs? <laughs> so, I guess I was assuming a whole lot of things there, so we went on to talk about the Beatles, and he was going to go back and Google them after work tonight, so that's the, you know, the fountain of all truth, of course, is Google. I'm delighted to be here tonight to be part of this launch. I think it's a really special occasion and a very special project. Personally, for me, I was in Japan last year lecturing and connected to a university in Hiroshima, and I'd have to say it was one of the most rewarding and stimulating times I've spent as an academic, particularly the time I spent with students who were really lively in their motivation to engage, a little, a little different perhaps from our students. But in particular, I was taken with the notion of social inclusion and people's interest in that. So I had a great experience there, only, only a brief one. But I'm really particularly pleased to be part of this launch because of Macquarie's University's association with it. We're really proud of this project and we're proud of it for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's really innovative. It's got the funky factor. I think the use of the <laughs> and if it's got the funky factor we know it's going to be successful but the use of technology is really good. Uh, I was looking at the, the video sites and getting very stimulated by people's narratives. I'll come to that in a minute. But I really like the way you've scaffolded it with the tweets and the tweet profiles. This really speaks to the way we use technology today and the way we build a community of interest electronically. So well done, it's really innovative. Secondly, I think this project focuses on a group of people who are overlooked often, and particularly in research, and those are transnationals. Transnational people, a lot of them in this room, make a really important contribution to the countries in which they're living and their countries of origin. And in this way, this project aligns perfectly with Macquarie University's social inclusion agenda through making visible the extent of multilingualism and multiculturalism in the community. It also addresses the richness, the complexity underpinning each transnational story it reminds us that it's not simple, a simple binary of either Japanese or Australian. It's much more complex and it's far richer. And on that front, I just want to make mention of three of the videos that stood out to me when I watched them that speak to that richness. First of all, Catherine Mahoney. Is she here? Yeah, she's here. Oh, okay. I've singled you out. I really like what you said about language and how learning language is something that then 
affects you as a whole person. It's not just something you put on your CV. That's a great quote. Good on you. Uh, Haruki Mori? Yes. Oh, there yes. you go. It's good to see the faces I saw in the video. Uh, and I think that your reflections on private time and maybe how that would influence lifestyle, but also maybe personality. Very in-depth reflections. Thank you for sharing them. Uh, I did have a favourite, and that's because I'm a romantic at heart, and that was Yuri Takahashi's story. Oh, <laughs> Yuri-san! <laughs> Yuri-san! <laughs> a story of love, language and jazz just appealed to me straight away. And I really liked your quote about home, and that was family is the basis of home. Thank you, that's a beautiful reflection, and that's a nice theme for this evening. But the third reason, and I speak now with my hat as a professor, is that this project represents good scholarship, useful research. It's what Patty Lather once described as research as praxis. That is, research that's not about aggrandizing the researcher per se, although these guys come out of it looking very good. It's about holding social change at its heart. It's about something that makes a difference, not just doing research for research's sake. It also speaks to a particular research paradigm. Uh, as Einstein said, not everything that can be measured counts, but not everything that counts can be measured. This is a particular research approach, a particular methodology that goes to the heart of narrative and experience. Good on them. So, in closing then, we need to remember that projects like this come about through a lot of effort and support in terms of resources. I'd like to acknowledge all the sponsors. And in particular, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the support of His Excellency, Shigekazu Seto and Kimitaka Azuma. Again, I congratulate Ingrid and Kimi on their outstanding efforts. They've proven indeed that as the saying goes, the world's not made up of atoms, it's made up of stories. Arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you so much, Gail, for your kind words and your kind support. Japanese on the Move has been very lucky to have had the support of um, Macquarie University and the fact that social inclusion is such a high priority in our university. It's a great honor for us that Japanese on the Move also has the support of the uh, Japanese Embassy and the Consulate General of Japan, Sydney. Now I would like to welcome to the stage Dr. Masahiro, uh, Masahiro, Masahiro Kohara, Consulate General of Japan in Sydney. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to be here to celebrate with you the realization of this fascinating project, Japanese on the Move, Life Stories of Transmigration. I would like to congratulate Professor Ingrid Pillar and Dr. Kimie Takahashi on their very interesting video interview project, which is supported by the Australian government, Australia Japan Foundation, and the Macquarie University's Faculty of Human Science. I believe this project is a very important contribution to the topic of identity of people moving across borders in today's globalized world. More and more people ask themselves, who am I? What or where is home? My own family has moved between several countries in the course of my work, and in particular, my children have moved back and forth between foreign countries and Japan since they were born. My daughter was born in Hong Kong, went to a kindergarten in New York, went to school in Japan, and then in Los Angeles, and then back in Japan and since two years ago here in Sydney. So it is always interesting for me to hear how others feel about their home, their reasons for moving, how they adapt to a new society, and how they identify themselves. 
I definitely feel Japanese. I love my homeland, and of course, I should do so as a diplomat. But at the same time, I'm aware that living overseas has influenced me and my family. Not only do I enjoy learning about new culture and different ways of thinking, but I value the opportunity that interacting in new environments creates for me to reflect on my own identity and what I cherish about Japan and its culture. Unfortunately, I wasn't among the people interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> As I mean, there are two points that I will have mentioned. <laughs> Firstly, in a recent survey of the easiest cities for Asians to live in, six of the top ten of the 265 cities included were Australian cities. Moreover, Sydney came in at the number two spot. I have lived in Sydney for two years now. I would have to agree with this result. Sydney is a very easy place for me and my family to live. Why? One of the reasons that I think so is, of course, the beautiful blue sky. <laughs> Even if it seems rather shy last summer, <laughs> more seriously, it comes from the multiculturalism of Australian society. In one of my books, I listed three keywords regarding multiculturalism, inclusion, tolerance, and discovery. As the conditions for the half melting pot and the half salad bowl, that is the United States. In this regard, I think Australian society is comparable to the United States. I would say that Australia really is a lucky country. In his latest book, the journalist Peter Harcher, who is my good friend, quotes me describing Australia as a man lying on a bed of treasure. I didn't mean Australian people are lazy. I mean Australia is very lucky to be a great land with many natural treasures, as well as having strong soft power like democracy and freedom, a high standard of education, and an egalitarian society with a multicultural base. Coming to the second point I would have mentioned, as one of the people in the interview said, Japanese often raise the question, where are you from? This may be understandable given the largely homogeneous nature of the Japanese people. However, in today's globalized world, people are increasingly mobile, moving across borders. Japanese people must overcome this narrow sense of identity based on ethnicity. They should interact and exchange their way, thinking and their culture with others in the world, so that Japanese people can become internationalized citizens who are needed in the competitive, globalized world. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that many people view the Japanese on the MOOC interviews readily accessible online. I found it very thought-provoking, and I, no doubt, Anyone who sees the interviews will be made to think, gaining a new insight into what it means to move between countries and cultures. Again, I'd like to say how highly I esteem this project and its contribution. Congratulations to all those involved in the project. Ingrid Pira, Kimiya Takahashi, the Australian Japan Foundation and Macquarie University. Thank you very much. Arigato. Um, for all your encouraging work. Um, the strong support of the Japanese community in Australia has really been very, very important to our project. But of course, Japanese on the move wouldn't have been possible without the generous funding of the Australia Japan Foundation, a section of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. 
It is therefore with immense gratitude that I hand over the microphone to Mr. Greg Earl, distinguished board member of the Australia Japan Foundation. Mr. Greg Earl is also the Asia Pacific and National Affairs Editor for the Australian Financial Review. He has been a foreign correspondent based in Jakarta, Tokyo and New York and now monitors Australia's relations with Asia. Welcome, Greg. Good evening. Um, Consul General Kahara, Professor Pfeiffer, um, guests. Um, uh, Australian and Japanese people have been visiting each other's countries for more than 150 years now. Um, in fact, this afternoon I was only reading the letters of a Japanese, uh, an Australian visitor to Japan, sorry, in, in 1910, who was on his way elsewhere, and they were, um, he visited several cities in Japan. Um, and so there's quite a body of um, of uh, anecdotal and, and substantial work about the, the history of those sorts of people. Um, but in his um, interview for this project, Ambassador Sato makes the point that, um, it was a common point made by a lot of analysts of japan australia bilateral relations these days, that the current relationship is um, a bit like a middle-aged marriage. Now, <laughs> I'll leave you to think about to yourselves about what that really means, lots of people say that. But, um, um, but one consequence of this situation is that the, um, the bilateral relationship is, is, um, has some of the uh, elements of, of ships passing in the night. Um, for example, um, Australian people don't realise how much of their wealth is, is depend, has, has depended on, and still does depend on, the, uh, the, the, the export of resources to Japan because it happens over in Western Australia and not many people are involved and not much knows about it. Likewise, in Tokyo, when people turn on their lights, they don't realise that the, the, the electricity comes from gas and coal that comes from Australia, and particularly these days with no nuclear energy. Um, so we don't really have many modern versions of those old stories of, of, of the visitors who, who have, have been documented quite a lot by, by historians. Um, uh, people like John Black, who was the first publisher of an English language newspaper in Japan, he was a gold rush um, uh, uh, departee who was going back to England, wound up in Japan, and, and never left. Um, then there's people like Shigeyoshi Hirodo, who, um, who was a young, uh, just finished school in Japan, and was sent off to Sydney by Kanamatsu, the trading company, the early trading company, to and, and basically set up the wool trade from between Australia and Japan. I think he thought he was just coming here to make his fortune, and he'd be back to Japan, but he's state, his family is safe here and still continue to be here. Um, so at the Japan, Australia Japan Foundation, um, which is not to be confused with the Japan Foundation, <laughs> our hosts here tonight, we're a much smaller organisation funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, but I'm just one of the external board members who's supposed to bring some community views to, to the funding process. Um, but we saw this project as, as fitting really well within one of we, what we see as one of our um, major objectives, which is to sort of try and um, um, provide more information about the, the depth and the complexity and the diversity of the modern relationship, which I think is, is sometimes lost to the broader community. Um, so, sorry. Um, um, so we aim to pr promote the strong, uh, you know, a strong, enduring, and close people-to-people -people links between Australia and Japan, and Japan across diverse range of, of sectors, and including arts, education, science, technology, sport, local government, community services and business. This is just one of the projects that we, we, we sponsor. Um, now these stories are really amazing. You know, the idea of people coming to Australia from Japan having set out to live in Southeast Asia, for example. Or you know, an Iranian who sets out to, to start a new life in Japan and who winds up living in Australia. You know, this is sort of a... It's a microcosm of the, of, the, of the modern world. It's a microcosm of a of, of, you know, long, deep, and, and, and productive bilateral relationship. So I'm delighted to be here tonight on behalf of the Australia-Japan Foundation Board. Um, the chairman was supposed to be coming, but I'm just filling in, to celebrate the launch of Japanese on the move, life stories of transmigration. Now, I congratulate um, Ingrid and Kimie for, for initiating the project, but more importantly for... Um, for taking it beyond traditional academic research dissemination and, and using the internet to, to, to do this. And even more important than that, to, to do it quickly and <laughs> as, you, as you've done the work. 
rather than waiting for three years to finish it, and then <laughs> you're publishing it in whatever form. Um, so this is the first comprehensive and interactive online archive of Japanese Australian voices. It really adds to that early work by historians about the early travels, I think. It should be a valuable resource, resource for academics and students and the media, like me, I think particularly since it's quite contemporary and you know, hopefully people will use it. Um, and it will be a really valuable addition to, to that early history that I talked about. So congratulations and I hope to hear a bit more about it. much, Greg, for reminding us of the long history um, where we are just a, a part of the journey of um, Japanese on the Move. Now, Japanese on the Move would not have happened without the generous financial support of the Australia-Japan Foundation. At the same time, it would have been impossible to conduct it without our participants. The participants who so generously shared their time and stories with us. We therefore asked one of our participants, Mayu Kanamori, to act as representative of our guests, if you will, on this occasion. <coughs> Mayu Kanamori is an artist, a journalist, and a philosopher. And she works as a freelance photographer and performance maker in Australia and in Japan. And she's most of all a great friend we made through this project. Mayu. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm short. <laughs> My name is Mayu Kanamori. I'm a Japanese on the move. <laughs> Look, the problem with being the last speaker is that everybody's said everything <laughs> that I plan to say. I grew up in Tokyo, going to an American school in Japan, and the Americans taught me that to make a good speech, I should either start with a quote from a famous person, or start with a rhetorical question, but of course I got to Australia in 1981 and I quickly learned that you're supposed to start a speech with a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but in the country where I was born, Japan, we start our uh, speeches with one big apology. <laughs> I'm sorry, even if the war wasn't ever mentioned. <laughs> but we are in Sydney today and most of us live in Sydney. Sydney 2012. Uh, is where we begin our speeches by uh, acknowledging the elders, past and present, of the Garigal people of the Yura Nation, on which land we gather today. So that's how it's done here and now. Uh, when Kimiya Takahashi first approached me with this project, Japanese on the Move with Ingrid Pilar, both linguists, I wondered how. Uh, study of linguistics related to issue of, uh, issues of transmigration. I thought it was about something else, about how we conduct <laughs> sentences. <laughs> and um, I think I was one of the first 50 that was interviewed, and none of the videos were up, so you know, I'm asked these questions. Seemingly simple, like, where's your home? Or uh, why did you move to Australia? And I say seemingly because it's actually not that simple. It's loaded. It's loaded for people like me and people like you. Loaded for people like us. It's loaded with our day-to-day -day struggles, endeavors, of trying to find our place, to find our identity, uh, and our own voice in our community. What community? And finding our own voice within ourselves. And it goes through other loaded aspects on a day-to-day -day level through our partners, our children, our parents, and our lifelong friends who may or may not share the same borders, uh, national borders, cultural borders. Maybe they're not real borders, they're imagined borders, but borders there are. It's about Finding a sense of belonging, and then finding it, then letting go. But now that the project's launched, and I've watched all the videos, uh. 50 stories, all different, yet 
deeply resonant within our collective experiences of being Japanese on the move. I under now understand why this project lies in the realm of linguistics. If linguistics uh, is a study of human language, and if language is a complex system of communication, is that right? And uh, if communication is, has to do with its original root meaning of the word share, yeah, then sharing we have done. And it was complex as well. <laughs> so we have not only shared in our individual stories, but somehow in this process, we found a common voice. The voice of all of us who have crossed borders, moved, and are moving throughout our lives. Between different cultures and places, and constantly negotiating and renegotiating how we may be and how we may become in this ever-changing world so fast. Look, I think I really want to thank everyone who participated in this project for sharing your stories with me. I know how difficult it is to um, commit yourself to tape on all these seemingly simple matters like where's our home and citizenship and cross-cultural relationships and things like that. Especially because, you know, we're on the move. Our opinions change. It's bound to change. And it's meant to evolve. You know, strangely enough, I actually feel this sense of belonging with you guys, all of you. Because like me, from time to time, if not constantly, you travel through space between belonging and not belonging. And thank you, Kimie and Ingrid. Uh, for empowering us with this knowledge through your work. And thank you especially for getting you our stories out of the academic text, as Greg said, <laughs> and make it accessible to all of us. Um, and also thank you for not making it a specialized documentary production, often losing itself in the maze of obscure film <laughs> festivals as well. Uh, it's out there for all of us to share. We are in Sydney and in cyberspace in 2012. And thank you for giving us our voice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayu. Um, as you've just said, I really feel like we've um, all got to know you in very special ways and um, certainly a sense of community and belonging has been created through this project. Now, when Kimi and myself were drafting the program for this evening, our greatest challenge actually was um, to decide when to offer dinner so that the speeches and the performances and the eating would not detract from each other but complement each other. And we think that now, um, after all these wonderful speeches, um, you've got enough food for thought and um, conversational material so that it's time to eat. Um, I believe the buffet is open, so please help yourself.
been extremely fortunate to have the support of many generous sponsors. We particularly acknowledge the Australia Japan Foundation, a section of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, whose generous financial funding made our research possible. Uh, special, uh, my, the microphone is not working. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Uh, <clears throat> special thanks are also due to Macquarie University's Faculty of Human Sciences, particularly the executive dean, Professor Janet Greeley, who saw value in a somewhat unusual project <laughs> and offered generous institutional and financial support. And if you think language on the move does sociolinguistics in style, it's due to the generous sponsorship of our fashion designer, Jaco Maricado, as well as the unfailing support, creativity, and sheer hard work of our web designer, Martin Dipsky, from the graphic design agency, Spider. Spasibo also to Lana Udra from uwebsitedesign.com. Furthermore, Language on the Move couldn't operate without our fantastic PhD students, and we particularly acknowledge those who have volunteered today, um, Dario Shisadi, Grace Chang, Hannah Torsh, Shiva Tabari, Vera Tete, Victoria Benz, and Xia Xiao Chen. Please also join me in thanking the Japan Foundation for providing us this wonderful venue for the launch, and our special thanks go to uh, the unfailing administrative support uh, provided by Tokuman-san, Tokuman-san, Irashiranai, arigatou gozaimashita. <laughs> and the uh, special character of this venue has been enhanced by uh, the gorgeous Ikebana, as you can see um, over there near the food section, mm -hmm. uh, sponsored by Yuga Floral Design Cafe. And I'm sure you enjoyed the food because, well, it's provided by uh, uh, Zman's uh, Chief Leeds, one of the best Japanese restaurants in Sydney. Last but not least, thanks uh, go to Kidding Brewery Australia for supporting the beautiful and delicious beers. <laughs> I know you're all starting to wonder where the surprise comes in. <laughs> Well, the biggest contribution to Japanese on the move, of course, has come from our amazing participants. So thank you again, everyone who participated in the videos. Now, Jetstar, two things that you guys are an extraordinarily mobile lot, and so they have donated two return tickets to Japan to raffle off amongst our participants. <laughs> But first, you have to watch their videos. <laughs> there are 7,000 people working at Jetstar, and everyone of us knows low fares are just part of the story. So, we're now having our draw among the Japanese on the move participants, and the lucky winner will be even more on the move than they've already been. <laughs> So can I ask my lucky charm assistant, Ava, to come on the stage and draw a winner for us? Thank <laughs> you. 